everybody. My name is Lauren Daniel, and I provide water education resources and other programs for teachers and students all across North Carolina. Today, we're going to sit down with some colleagues and learn a little bit about interbasin transfers, or IBTs. IBTs are a complicated topic, and so I started just asking them basic questions. But before we get into the questions, I asked them to introduce themselves to us. Hey, thanks, Lauren. I'm, uh, I'm Harold Brady. Uh, I am the Water Supply Development Coordinator uh, and the Interim Interbasin Transfer Coordinator. I help systems uh, find sources of water uh, when they see projected shortfalls. Great, thanks, Lauren. Uh, my name is Kim Nemmer, and I'm currently the uh, Emerging Compounds Coordinator for the Division of Water Resources, um, working with different areas within the division uh, that sample and are looking at the best ways to address compounds of emerging concern in our waters across the state. Uh, and I'm joining the conversation today because I'm formerly the Interbasin Transfer Program Coordinator. So um, look forward to our conversation. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kim. And Linwood. Hello, my name is Linwood Hill. Uh, of course, I'm the with the Division of Water Resources, and I'm the supervisor for the Water Supply Planning Branch. And um, Interbasin Transfer is one of the many programs in our purview. But today I'll be here because I have um, a little bit more history than most here today. I, um, this is my 25th year. And um, for all about 22 years dealing with innovation change. So then I decided to ask them, just really simply put, what is an interbasin transfer? Simply put, an interbasin transfer is the uh, the withdrawal of water from a source basin, surface water source, and the movement of that water to a receiving basin, surface water. Surface water. So just we're just talking about like rivers and streams. That's correct. Okay. Lakes. That that's about the simplest way to put it. Uh, and to again emphasize that we're not talking about groundwater. So we're not withdrawing groundwater from a well. It's just moving surface water from one river basin to another river basin. Excellent. Next, I asked them to explain why might somebody or a group of people apply to have an interbasin transfer? You need to come to us to request an interbasin transfer certificate. If they see that their demand uh, will exceed, uh, their, their transfer demand would exceed 2 million gallons a day. Wait, 2 million gallons a day? I can't even wrap my head around 2 million gallons a day. I do know that the EPA says that the average American uses about 88 gallons per day. But what does 2 million gallons a day actually look like? Okay, to give a person a visual context of 2 million gallons, a large water tank in Raleigh, Jordan, about 2 million gallons. Oh, you mean the, a big water tower? Yeah, water tower. One of those is 2 million gallons. Okay, that's that's great. All right, because I've definitely seen one of those before. <laughs> it's all over town. Then I asked them to explain what were the pros and cons to interbasin transfers? What are both sides of the coin, so to speak? Because the process to receive an IBT certificate is very long and complicated. And it also allows for people on both sides to understand and give their comments about what they think about having an interbasin transfer happen in their own community. Um, some of the more typical issues that we run across uh, are uh, in the source basin. For example, in the source basin, uh, someone downstream will be concerned of the removal of that water because uh, that water is being is being transferred, for, is being withdrawn from a point in the source basin and discharged into the receiving basin. And so a downstream user may be, may be concerned that they've just lost some of the water that would have otherwise flowed down to them. That's a common concern. Well, and, and I guess another, uh, another way to think about it is um, if there's a, a community that is 
either currently situated on or because it's growing is straddling um, a high point, say a ridge line that separates two river basins. And in order to provide water to all of the people in their service area, by necessity, move some of that water across river basin boundaries. But in the past, we have had water users, such as agriculture, who wanted to take water from one area and go across the ridge line to the other area, um, another basin from one river basin to another river basin. Um, but we generally don't get that all, you know, all the time. And we have a couple of power companies that grandfathered in, which is another term, um, that move water from one river basin to another river basin. But since they were doing it before the statute was put in place, they're allowed to do it. Well, I will say that uh, so every uh, every interbasin transfer is unique, much like every water system across the state uh, is is unique. It, it has things about it that uh, other that, that are unique to its own self. So every interbasin transfer is therefore unique. And similarly, um, or in addition to, you know, there can be concerns in the receiving basin because the receiving basin is requesting this water usually because they are experiencing or are anticipating more growth. And so that's where kind of the secondary impacts come in, you know, secondary impacts associated with that growth and development, the building of infrastructure, the additional uh, impermeable surfaces where water doesn't soak into the ground, but instead runs off and can create, you know, additional effects, um, potentially negative effects to the environment. So that's it. That's basically what interbasin transfers are all about. I want to thank my guests, Harold, Kim, and Linwood, uh, for your time and expertise answering my questions, and I hope you were able to learn something. <laughs>